Today, uh, I would like to move on the plenary talks uh, since now. So our uh, first invited speaker is from uh, session 14. Uh, Dr. Mel Soman. Dr. Soman is an associated professor and head of the Department of Environmental and Geographical Sciences at the University of Cape Town. Over the years, uh, Dr. Soman has been involved in a diverse range of research and consulting projects, ranging from integrating sustainability principles into development planning processes in South Africa, exploring models of governance across a range of the natural resource sectors in sub-Saharan Africa, to assessing socio-ecological vulnerability and developing adaptation strategies to climate changes in Benguela current large marine ecosystem regions. She is also involved in a number of the large interdisciplinary research projects in South, Southern Africa, South Asia, and Canada, concerned with the governance of small-scale fisheries, balancing conservation and social justice imperatives. Today, uh, Dr. Soman will be presenting on community vulnerability assessment to inform adaptation planning inside uh, from Southern Africa. So welcome, Dr. Soma. Well, good morning, everybody. And firstly, thanks very much to the conference organizers for inviting me to this conference and giving me this opportunity to present this presentation. So I'm going to get started straight away. Um, yesterday, we heard from Eric Galbraith, who provided us with a big picture story, telling us about um, how to use big human ecosystem models for assessing climate change. And today, I'm going to take us in a completely different direction and talk about community-level vulnerability assessments and how these can inform adaptation planning, drawing on insights from the Benguela current large marine ecosystem region in Southern Africa. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about vulnerability assessments in general, and then pose the question, why do community-level vulnerability assessments? I'll spend a little bit of time overviewing a current um, rapid vulnerability assessment tool that we've recently developed, focus on some of the adaptation strategies that evolved out of that process, and then look a little bit at this question of linking local knowledge and science. I'll then reflect on how we can use community vulnerability assessments to inform adaptation planning and grapple a little bit with this issue of vertical and horizontal integration. So just some considerations when approaching vulnerability assessments. I mean, there's some questions we need to ask ourselves. You know, who are vulnerable or who are most vulnerable? What is vulnerable? Are we dealing with this at a country level? Are we looking at a particular sector, the agricultural sector or an ecosystem? Or are we looking at this at a community level? We also need to ask ourselves the question, vulnerable to what? Are we looking at this in general terms? Vulnerability to climate change? Or are we being specific? Are we looking at shoreline erosion in a particular region? New fisheries regulations that might impact on small-scale fisheries? From my perspective and the work we're doing, what I'm interested in is exploring the vulnerability context of small-scale fishing communities and how climate change exacerbates this vulnerability context. And then we need to ask ourselves, why do these vulnerability assessments? Well, for most of us, we're involved in this because we want to reduce vulnerability, we want to increase resilience, but essentially we're doing this work to improve targeting and effectiveness of adaptation actions and strategies. 
So we know that global climate change is a, well, climate change is a global phenomenon, but it really has its impacts at the local level. And these increased risks and uncertainty create challenges for food security, livelihoods, and also impede, impede development process. So it becomes critical for us to understand vulnerability at the local level. And what I'll be arguing in this conference is how important it is to understand vulnerability at the local level, and that this is an imperative for local adaptation planning, as is the integration of local and indigenous knowledge. Because failure to do this may lead to adaptation actions that are both ineffective and could even be maladaptive. There are various researchers, and increasingly researchers are trying to take a more holistic, what I call a socio-ecological lens approach to vulnerability assessment. There's the work of people like Sina et al. in Kenya, who've looked at socio-ecological vulnerable, vulnerability to coral reef fishery ecosystems, to climatic shocks and trying to come up with a vulnerability index to ascertain this. Moving over to the Philippines, the work of people like Mamag, who've also tried to look at vulnerability in a more holistic sense, looking at fisheries vulnerability, socioeconomic vulnerability, and then coming up with a composite vulnerability assessment. Our work is focusing on community-level vulnerability, and this work was tasked by, or commissioned by the uh, the, the FAO, and we were specifically tasked with developing and applying a rapid community socio-ecological vulnerability assessment. And rapid in the sense of wanting a tool that could be undertaken in a short space of time and gather enough information in order for us to be able to identify strategies. And the second aspect was to explore what strategies and adaptive capacity was required to reduce vulnerability. The development of this tool and its application has been undertaken in collaboration with my colleague Serge Rymikos, who's at UCT, and the director of the NPO, Abelobi. So what are some of the features of these vulnerability, community-level vulnerability assessments? Well, we're interested in hearing community voices. We want to explore community knowledge. We want to understand what are the threats and stresses facing communities? What are their observations and experiences? What are their perceptions of change? And how are they coping? How are they adapting? And what adaptation strategies do they believe are feasible and appropriate? So I'm taking us to the Benguela current large marine ecosystem where we did this work. We're starting off with small-scale fishers. These communities are largely socially and economically marginalized. They're mostly poor. Their lives and livelihoods depend on coastal marine resources that are often already fragile and stressed. And climate change in this instance is really just an added stressor. Our approach to this work has been very consultative with Benguela current stakeholders at government, NGO, and local level. And our focus has been particularly to work with local actors, NGOs, cooperative leaders, local communities, with a view to drawing on and gaining an understanding of local knowledge. We developed the RVA and we applied it in eight communities in the region. And in this first phase of work, we have also trained over 50 participants in the use of this tool. So what I'm going to share with you in this uh, next five to 10 minutes is the actual RVA workshop process. I'm going to take you quite quickly through the steps before I turn to what I call phase two of vulnerability assessment, and that is to inform adaptation planning. So if we look at the rapid vulnerability assessment workshop process, this is a two-day process. It basically involves the bringing together of community people, um, working through NGOs, local leaders, cooperative members, to identify a nice, a, a good diversity of people within the community, fishers, older fishers, women, youth, um, people involved in, in, in marketing and selling, and to take them through a, a, a two-day process. And it's a series of exercises which build on each other, ultimately leading to the ability to come up with adaptation strategies. We leave the third day open for possible focus group meetings or meeting with elders in the community who may not have been able to be at the workshop 
to drill down on certain issues that emerged in the workshop that we feel need further attention. So I'm going to really run through these quite quickly, but just to give you a flavor of how the exercises build on each other. We start with a village mapping exercise, which of course is an excellent icebreaker, but it also helps communities really reflect on their resources, their assets and their attributes, but also for facilitators to learn how fishes value and understand their environment. We then move into identifying stresses and threats that communities are facing on a daily basis in the categories environment, socioeconomic, management or governance. And this is a visual gathering exercise where people present their stresses and threats, they get categorized into these different headers, and um, obviously the key issues then get uh, listed. It also gives us an opportunity if we want to identify differences in terms of uh, priorities between men and women, giving people different little color coded. This could be done for youth and for other groups. And of course, this information one is able to then present um, and get a good idea of what some of the key stresses are in these different communities. The next important exercise is to get fishers to then drill down on the environmental category. What are some of the key events? What are the changing environmental conditions that they have experienced in their day-to-day -day fishing? And these events can range from major red tide events, in the case of South Africa, major rock lobster walkouts, in the case of Angola, we heard about beach erosion from some big storms, and then to talk more specifically about the changes that have been observed over time. Of course, this is going to depend on who's in the group. Are we talking about, um, are there a number of elder people in the group, elder fishers, who can go back 30, 40 years, or do we have a younger audience? And they will then reflect on, possibly using a timeline, some of the changes that they have noted in their environment. We then have an exercise where we reflect on these stresses and look at the impacts associated with these changing environmental conditions or events. These could be things around changing seasons, reduced catches, the fact that resources might be further out. And we look at the impacts and we then ask people to consider what they regard to be the main causes of these changes. And for many communities, it might be as simple as its nature. But in many instances, people have heard of climate change, and we found that this did emerge in many of our workshops. What we like to do then is get people to reflect on these impacts and to try and get some sense of the linkages between the stresses that have been identified. Of course, we're drilling down here on the environmental changes that we've noted. But of course, if we go back to some of our social stresses at the bottom, if we look at increase, for example, in alcohol and drug abuse, which was very prevalent in many of our communities, and unemployment, if we begin to trace some of the, back, the causal links, we find that, for example, the southward migration of rock lobster, or, for example, the fact that northwesterly winds are no longer signaling the arrival of a particular fish species is contributing to those stresses. We then look at um, the, the various institutional actors that are involved in these different community fisheries, because of course we are going to need to liaise with and draw on these actors in the de development of the strat adaptation strategies. We also explore coping mechanisms, and just giving you an idea of some of the feedback we got from one of our workshops in St. Helena Bay, you know, people said, well, after the red tide, we ate seabirds. We began to poach in the protected area. We sold our boats, and we began to crew for commercials. And of course, these are short-term survivalist strategies, and they don't provide solutions. So what we're interested then is working with communities in identifying what strategies they believe could work or could work. And this is a big focus of the workshop, we spend the entire second afternoon going through this process in groups and then in plenary. And this just gives you a quick snapshot of some of the key strategies that emerged from these workshops. The need to support building local level organizations, the need for access to the internet, for weather forecasts, we need to share information, and then of course things like diversifying livelihoods 
I think one of the things that is important to note that some of these strategies at this level of a workshop might simply be a wish list. And of course, some of these strategies might be things you can do fairly quickly. Others will be more medium term and others will take a much longer term to achieve. And so in our phase one work of this vulnerability assessment um, tool, we actually were able to proceed to the implementation of some of the immediate adaptation actions, for example, some skills training workshops, getting communities to visit other co-ops to learn about how co-ops work in the effort to build local organizational capacity, and we were able to roll out something called the Abelobi app, which is a smartphone app, and I mention this because although this would have been an example of perhaps a longer-term strategy, this app had been developed in parallel with this process, and it really is a, an app for local fishers to be able to record their catches, record their fuel use, take note of weather conditions, share their information, get weekly stats on the, their total catches for the week, contact marketers, and so this has been a very empowering tool that has got the support of government and that is being rolled out in South Africa at the present time. One of the highlights of this work, which I just want to share briefly with you, is how we were able to link some of these fisher observations and perceptions to the available science. So basically what we did is we took the available, we, 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 we basically documented for each case study the fisher knowledge that emerged from this process and we then looked at the extent to which it resonated with the available science. And we found a high level of correlation across these knowledge systems. And so I think one of the key messages that I want to leave with, with you is the value of this local fisher knowledge. The fact that not only is it valuable for the fisher community themselves to explore and share this information, but it can provide an early indication of change to the scientific community. It can complement available science. It can also suggest where research might be needed. And critically, it can help guide the questions that we should be asking when we're analyzing our data. So again, it's a very busy a slide, I don't want to go into the details, but what we did was in column two, we documented the experiences and perceptions of fishers to climate change, we looked at the species-specific changes that they identified, and then we looked in columns three and four at the scientific knowledge and looked at areas of correlation. So how then do we use this RVA, this vulnerability assessment information for adaptation planning? Well, certainly we've learned that the RVA can provide an appraisal of vulnerability of communities to climate change. It's very much a bottom-up process. It provides information for grounded adaptation strategy, and in this regard, it lends legitimacy to the process and to the kinds of strategies that are then potentially implemented. It also allows for the triangulation with other knowledges, with the available science. And critically important, it's a social learning process in that it's empowering for those who participate in it. So going on to phase two then of the overall role, role, vulnerability assessment process, taking that information and feeding it into a community adaptation planning process. A key focus here is fleshing out the strategies that we identified in the, um, in the, in the rapid vulnerability assessment process. We're interested in how feasible are these strategies? How appropriate? What resources are needed? And this is a very detailed, ongoing, iterative process. We're interested in issues around the short, you know, what are short-term, what are medium and long-term strategies? What information do we need? Who can assist? What resources are required? Where will we get resources? Do we, go, do we need to go off and write a funding proposal? But I think what's critical to realize is that these are slow processes. There will be setbacks. There are changing priorities in communities, but there are also improvements by participating and then implementing these outcomes. A couple of final slides I want to leave you with, and it's an area that I think we've really got to start um, grappling with, is how do we take these knowledges at different scales and how do we begin to integrate information? 
So if we look at the local adaptation planning process, which leads to a local adaptation plan, which might be com driven by communities, the question then is how do you insert that information into sub-national and into national adaptation planning processes, into the so-called NAPs, but not only into these national adaptation planning processes, but also into sector planning processes, in the tourism, in the agriculture, in the fishery sector. And of course, how do we mainstream that information derived at a community level horizontally into local level planning processes, which might be looking at tourism, transport, or economic development? And drawing on some work from ISSD, I think what is really critical to begin to think about is how do we take this sharing of knowledge, this so-called knowledge integration between science and local and indigenous communities through the entire process, planning, implementing our strategies, and monitoring and, in, and evaluation? I think critical to this process are a number of enabling factors, and I haven't got time to go into them, but clearly putting in place the appropriate institutional mechanisms to enable local communities to inter interface with and interact with institutional uh, arrangements at higher levels, setting up the mechanisms for information sharing and deliberation, and the critical importance of champions. We need champions not only at the local level, but we also need champions in government, in the scientific community. Champions who are willing to spend the time and to listen and to integrate local knowledge and local perceptions in their work. We need resources, of course, and we need capacity development. And very often through these processes of engagement between local communities and scientists and government, this is where this capacity development takes place. And I think what's critically important is that this work needs to be underpinned by a number of principles. These are principles of respect, of inclusivity, of gender sensitivity, of knowledge co-production, and of course, flexibility and responsiveness. And so the key messages I want to leave you with are one, is we need to be clear about the focus of our vulnerability assessment. Why are we doing them? We need to acknowledge and recognize that there's enormous value in community knowledge and that these can inform locally appropriate adaptation plans. We need to encourage collaboration. And I mean, we've seen lots of diagrams um, around the sort of social science, natural science divide across these disciplines, across sectors, across government, researchers, and communities. And critically important, we need to find ways, creative ways of bringing these knowledges together. And recognize that this adaptation planning is an ongoing pro iterative process. It kind of never ends. So going forward, I really want to recommend that for those of us in this area of bridging local and scientific knowledge is we really need to focus on improving this integration between this vertical and horizontal in integration. And we need to be supporting those abling factors to be put in place and to be guided by a set of principles that we can all um, subscribe to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Soma. So we have a time for a couple of questions. So please come to the microphone, please. Yes, Mania. Thank you, Mel. This is a fantastic uh, explanation of how you go through the whole process, which is hard work, I can see. Eh? There's no shortcutting here. Um, so you ended up in the end with national adaptation plans and the like, and I can see that working very well, but it works for small-scale fisheries. I mean, you focus on small-scale fisheries. So um, what are your thoughts about rolling this process with big operators? Because in my perspective, many big operators have the same aspirations as those small-scale fisheries, but sometimes they have a longer-term view. Um, will this work, this process work with uh, sort of large operators? And are you thinking about that? Well, to be honest, and I mean, that's a good point, um, I have really been focusing very much at the community level. And I think certainly... In developing this uh, tool, we did think quite, you know, we, we thought broadly across the sectors. So we certainly don't feel that the tool is only applicable at the, low, at, at the sort of small-scale fisheries level, but it's applicable in agriculture, forestry, and so forth. 
Um, I guess, I guess in terms of going through those exercises, I mean, I'm sure there would be value in taking any group of people across those exercises in trying to arrive at what they believe are some of the key issues, the impacts, the changes that they've noticed, and then moving towards adaptation strategies. But I would have to give quite a bit of thought to if there might be other steps that we might need to insert. Perhaps how we structure the workshop might be important. I mean, we've spent, you know, we've done 16 workshops in different communities now using this methodology. We've trained people, and of course, through training, you also find out what works and what doesn't work. So we feel it's been quite well streamlined and works in a two-day process in communities. You know, in different sectors, amongst commercial operators, for example, there might be some logistical things that you would change, but I think in essence, you know, going through those steps would probably be yield some useful information. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. We, we had the chance to discuss in the past uh, days or weeks, and so, so as you know, uh, FAO is trying very hard to, to, to bring this climate change and development agenda together in a way of trying to address the nexus between climate change and climate responses and how that might increase or decrease poverty and inequalities. And I think, I mean, uh, your presentation was very enlightening in that, in that sense. So I, I, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more uh, on, on when you identify the different strategies that are uh, raised by the communities, if you also look at uh, uh, broader national strategies towards social development within these countries, uh, such as social protection schemes, for instance, that would perhaps support the communities in coping with some of these, with, of the impacts. You know? So instead of, as you mentioned, some of the communities in the cases of stress, they have to basically do things that they should not be doing, and while some social protection schemes have proved already to be quite effective in that. So the question is, if you are, if you are looking at those and if you are trying to bring those actors or those stakeholders at also in the process, because that could be a very nice way of mainstreaming climate change within the development agenda and the, the development agenda within the climate change. Thanks, Daniela. Um, yeah, so I think the first point to make is that in these adaptation planning processes at community level, we are really being guided by what is coming from communities. So, you know, communities will identify what they believe are the most appropriate strategies, what actions are needed, who the players are. And of course, what we hear very often is that if we're dealing in small-scale fisheries communities, it's not necessarily the Department of Fisheries that is the actor or the institution that's going to be important when we're dealing with diversification of livelihoods or when we're dealing with extreme cases of vulnerability. So the idea then is that once communities are clearer and we've, we've really begun to work through in a lot of detail all the points about the strategies, the who, the actors, what support we need, is that we then begin to engage with the other actors that have a role to play in making these adaptation strategies implementable. So yes, it is very much about bringing on board the other actors, looking at other opportunities. And this is multi-sectoral work. This is, this is working across departments, both horizontally and vertically, because of course in different countries, different departments have got mandates at different levels. But this, I stress again, this is slow work. This is time consuming and it requires champions. It requires people at, in government, in communities, in research agencies to be willing to go to, to go through the process, because it is through the deliberations, it is through that face time with other actors that you begin to hear about the realities of the ground, on the ground, but that communities also begin to hear about the constraints facing government or about issues that perhaps they might not be aware of. So I can't stress enough the importance of iteration and of deliberation and through deliberation, um, this kind of knowledge sharing and co-production of knowledge. Yeah, we have uh, several other questions, but uh, now is the time. So thank you very much again, Dr. Senna. Thank you very much. Thank you.